Welcome to the Books of Titans podcast, where I seek truth in the world's great books. I'm your host, Eric Rostad, coming to you from the beautiful Books of Titans studio in Franklin, Tennessee. My goal is to read 200 of the great books over the next 10 years and share what I'm learning. I'll talk a bit about each book, tie ideas together from a variety of genres, and share the one thing I always hope to remember from each of the great books. Today, I'm going to cover Babylon by Paul Kruaksek with the tagline Mesopotamia and the Birth of Civilization. This is book 19 for my 2023 reading list. Well, I took a, a, a slight step back from the great books a few months ago to read a book about Assyria, Babylon, and the Persians. I, it came to a point where I, these civilizations kept coming up in my readings, and I didn't know a whole lot about them. And so I, I, I wanted to get just the basics. So I got three different books that, that give a broad overview of these civilizations. And so in the episode about Assyria, I, I shared what I learned there. Today, I'm going to be sharing about what I learned about Babylon, and, and really, as the subtitle suggests, uh, about Mesopotamia. And then uh, per perhaps next week, I will cover what I learned about Persia. So in this book, it starts off with a, a neat part, and, and this is just right on page one, and it's talking about the, it, there's a description about uh, of, of an execution of a tyrant. And so I just want to read this paragraph. The cruel tyrant's army crumbles away. He himself escapes, disappears from sight for a time, but is eventually discovered filthy and heavily bearded, cowering like an animal in a hole in the ground. He is taken captive, pub publicly humiliated, held in solitary confinement for a thousand days and put on trial before a tribunal whose verdict is a foregone conclusion. Hanging him, his exultant executioners almost tear off his head. End quote. That may sound familiar. It, it may have hints of ancient civilizations and ancient times, but this is actually a description of the hanging of Saddam Hussein on December 30th, 2006. And this takes place in Iraq, in this in this land we're talking about, in, in this land of Babylon, in Mesopotamia. And the author's point right from the start here, it, it, it's something he says right before this, that the language of daily journalism was inadequate to encompass such extravagant, larger-than-life events, uh, end quote. That's, that's what he felt about this, this execution of, of Saddam Hussein as, as, it's, as it's taking place. And it, it was a great way to lead in to this book, because this is a land of these, these just lar larger-than-life history. Uh, and, and this book itself chronicles the history of Mesopotamia, and highlights the mystery of it, but also its impact on us. Uh, a few years back, I read a book, uh, how, how the Scots invented the modern world. And, and that author, Arthur Miller, he, he talked about all the ways in, with, in which Scotland, through its ideas and inventions, how uh, this tiny country had impacted the world and, and really a, a lot of the, of the founding of, of the United States in, in different ideas there. Well, this book, Babylon, it, it, in a similar vein, is showing how the ideas of Babylon, how the civilization, how so much of what we know today can really be traced back to Mesopotamia. And we're talking about a huge time frame here. We're talking about 4000 BC. And then this book really kind of closes out around the time where this area starts interacting with the Bible and, and specifically with Israel and, and Judah. And so that that's the time frame. Obviously, the introduction we get into 2006 with with Saddam Hussein, but but really for the for the sake of the, the main part of the book, we're talking early, early history, 4000 BC, all the way up to, um, you know, 500, six, five, 600 uh, BC. It covered everything from its ancient past, uh, old Babylon, Assyria, Neo-Babylon, and then concluded with its downfall. I was actually worried going into it because it, it is a somewhat relatively short book. And, and I was worried it just wasn't going to give me the overview that I was hoping to get about Babylon. Like the Assyria book was excellent. The per, the book about Persia was was fantastic. This, I just kind of looked at it. I read the back or, or I read some comments about it. And I just thought, oh, did I get did I get the wrong book? Uh, but but I read it and I am so glad I did. It, it exceeded all of my expectations, and it, it went way beyond just a history of this area. Uh, the author would just get into 
um, our big ideas, like considering how we look at history or, or just deep questions that went beyond the, the pale of just, you know, here's, here's what happened uh, 5,000 years ago, 6,000 years ago. So it, it, w- it was excellent in that sense. And, and I, I learned a lot. It interacted in, and spoke of many things that I have come across in the great books or in some of the, the other guidebooks that I've read. And I'll try to, to highlight some of those in this episode. For reading stats, this is a 282-page book. It took me 10 hours and 13 minutes to read it. That was over 11 days. I was traveling for, for part of that time, and so I didn't didn't read as, as quickly as uh, other books, perhaps, but uh, I read it between May 31st and June 10. So in the next segment, segment I want to highlight four ideas that uh, I came across that really stuck out to me. And then in segment three, I'll close out how I always do with the one thing, my one key takeaway from this book about Babylon and Mesopotamia. Well, if you've listened to other episodes this year, you know that I've I've really been flabbergasted by the whole flood thing, the deluge story. Uh, as as I've always known it, it's the the Noah's Ark story. Uh, and then my first book of the Great Books Project was the Epic of Gilgamesh. And in the Epic of Gilgamesh, there is another flood story that was written a thousand years or more before the Noah flood story. So what 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 do we do with that? Uh, these are the kind of the questions I've asked. I, I got a book just about the uh, Gilgamesh's flood story, and I hope to cover that in an upcoming episode. But I really, I, I got very interested in this, and just you know, what what does it mean? Did the did the authors of the Hebrew Bible were were they just copying this story? Uh, it appears that it had been around for a while, and and the the story in Gilgamesh is so similar to the Noah story that the, the, just these questions come up. And so this was addressed. There's actually a a chapter in this book, chapter four, I believe. Yeah. Chapter four, the flood. And so I want to read a few parts here and then talk about this a little bit. So here we go. Thus, it was established that long before Genesis was committed to writing, the ancient Mesopotamians had themselves told the story of a universal flood sent by divine decree to destroy humanity. Soon other texts were discovered that gave similar accounts in several different languages, Sumerian, Old Akkadian, Babylonian, and in several different versions. The Mesopotamian account differed from the Hebrew Bible in one important respect, however, God's motive for sending the flood. The reason given in Genesis is humanity's wickedness. The Atrahasis epic, on the other hand, explained that the supreme god en- Enlil decided to destroy human- humankind because of insomnia. The land, ex- and here's a, a quote from, from this, the land extended and the peoples multiplied. The land was bellowing like a bull. The God was disturbed by their uproar and little heard their noise and addressed the great gods. The noise of mankind has become too intense for me with their uproar. I am deprived of sleep and quote. And so then this God, uh, decrees that the, the flood is to come. And so that, that's one thing that, that when I, when I first came across the the story of of the flood in Gilgamesh, uh, and then and then later Atrahasis in uh, the Enuma Elish in Atrahasis story, uh, you've got what what stuck out is yes the stories are similar, but the motive for the flood and then the ramifications after are different, and that's the key point. That's that's. That's what needs to be noted in these stories. And and I guess for me, just the fact that there was a flood story in a number of different civilizations, I'd always heard that, but I just had never come across it in my own reading. And so that stuck out. But then to think about it further and just to note that there, in, 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 as it's stated here, God's motive for sending the flood was different. So in, in Genesis, the Noah story, it's because of humanity's wickedness. That's the reason for the flood. And then there's the ramifications after the flood are a lot different than what you see in, in these other, the, the, the Mesopotamian accounts. But how, how f- in a way, funny is it that in the Atrahasis epic about the flood, how funny is it that the the reason for the flood flood is that the gods just got sick of the noise of the people? I mean, it's like it's like the classic father telling his kids to just 
keep it down. I mean, I'm doing this constantly all day, like, keep it down, be quiet. And I, that's the reason for the flood in that I, 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 I get a kick out of that. But to, to a deeper level and, and a more important po- point, it's, it's important to look at the motive for the flood and the ramifications afterwards. So I, I loved how he pointed this out. And it's something I've been thinking about a lot this this year. Let me read just one last part of this. A single witness, the Bible might be thought unreliable, but now that several supposedly in, independent narrators have been found to agree that there really had been a universal deluge, its historic truth seemed established, end quote. The author of this book then goes on to to just state the flood in in thought of this time, uh, the, the idea of the flood, it really separated out to kind of a prehistory and and then once you started having history because the other thing the flood would have done was to wipe out any any records. Uh, even these clay tablets, tablets that we have, they, they do well if it's a dry location. If they interact with water, it doesn't do so well. So a flood would have wiped out the records of this time. And so in Gilgamesh, we even see that the, the, this idea that there was knowledge before the flood. And, and, and that's a big deal that Gilgamesh, it's right at the beginning of Gilgamesh, that, that, uh, that Gilgamesh had had taught had spoken to somebody and, and had ex- it heard things that happened before the flood that this was such a big deal and it just you you see this idea keep coming up that the flood wiped out wiped out a lot of things and a lot of ideas and in, in, in advances and in that sort of thing and so it just it's, it's one of those things I, I just can't get enough of it and I can't I can't stop thinking about it. And so I, I loved that it came up here and, and that I read about it. Uh, also, if you've listened to this episode, I'm going to get into to the second idea here now. You uh, you are aware of my fascination with Inhedawana and just coming across her writings this year, uh, the, the translations done by Sophus Hell, and just that that came out in April of this year, 2023. And and Hedawana is it gets a little mention in this book as well. And so let me let me read this. And and what's cool is it takes place in a part talking about a shift that occurred, a shift in thinking uh, about and focusing on the gods to focusing on mankind. So here we go. The age of Sargon in Naram Sin altered all that, switched the focus to the human world, and introduced a new conception of the meaning of the universe, one that made people, rather than gods, the principal subjects of the Mesopotamian story. Humanity was now in control. When Sargon appointed his own daughter to the position of an priestess, perhaps the equivalent of managing director or CEO of the Temple of the Moon God, Nana at Ur, mother house of all moon temples, she brought an element of Bronze Age heroic style into the practice of religion itself. Even here, the focus shifted from heaven to earth, from the gods to their worshipers. Sargon's daughter made herself the first identifiable author in history, and the first to express a personal relationship between herself and her god. Next up, um, her composition, now speaking of Inhedawan here, her compositions, though only recent only rediscovered in modern times, remained models of petitionary prayer for even longer. Through the Babylonians, they influenced and inspired the prayers and psalms of the Hebrew Bible and the Homeric hymns of Greece, end quote. And then uh, let me go to this last part here about Inhedawana. If only... We could translate adequately into modern language the ancient Sumerian with all of the richness of multiple meanings and readings that cuneiform writing makes both possible and inevitable. This passionate address by a priestess to the goddess Inanna would be prized among the jewels of world of, of world literature, end quote. And how funny is that, 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 uh, well, this was written before this year, this book was, uh, how funny is it that now we, we do have those writings in modern language done by Sophus Hell in, in, uh, his translation of Benhedawana this year. So just a neat section there first, just talking about the shift, uh, and, and you see that in Benhedawana's writings, uh, of, of this, of, of this human entreating the, the God and, and, 
get trying to get her to to the god the goddess to do something on her behalf and uh that just the plea and and all that it's 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 very very interesting and it was neat to read about it on on this side of it next up we have the david goggins of ancient mesopotamia a man named Shulgi, he was a king, and his father was Ur-Namu, and he built one of these huge ziggurats. ziggurats. And these are, are these, hugely, these huge stepped things, and they, they, they actually think that uh, this may have been what the Tower of Babel was, is these, uh, these ziggurats. And so his father had done this, and so the son you know, his father built this huge thing and, and the son's thinking, okay, what am I going to do to establish myself in history as, as having done something of, of uh, worth? And so here's what he, he decided to do. And I'm going to start reading here. He chose to run from Nippur, the religious center of Sumer, to the state capital Ur, about 100 miles, and back again on a single day. His purpose was quite clear as expressed in one of his praise hymns, so that my name should be established for distant days and never fall into oblivion, so that my praise should be spread throughout the land and my glory should be proclaimed in the foreign lands. I, the fast runner, summoned my strength and to prove my speed, my heart prompted me to make a return journey from Nippur to Brickbuilt Ur, as if it were only the distance of a double hour. Uh, and that, that's the end of... Shulgi's quote, but then back into the author's quote here, he was aiming to officiate in a religious festival in both cities on the same day, end quote. I, I thought that was fantastic. So here you've got a guy running 200 miles in one day, and that is what, that was the, the lasting thing that he wanted to be known for. And so you've got the David Goggins of, um, of ancient Mesopotamia, or perhaps David Goggins is the Shulgi of modern time. Hmm. And the last thing I want to highlight here in this section is deportation. So this book, I, even though I read a book about the Assyrians and covered it in the other episode, this book gets into the Assyrians as well as they, because they were in this area. And so this is the foreign policy of Assyria. And the reason I want to highlight this is it plays an enormous part in the Bible in the sense of the Assyrians attacking Assyria. Israel and the 10 tribes of Israel. So here was what the Assyrian, th this is from the Assyrians point of view of what they would do to a conquered people. So let me read this and then I, I'll, I'll talk about it briefly right after that. Uh, all who lived in Assyria were Assyrians, no matter what language they spoke or what customs they followed, all were subject to the same benefits and burdens, the same taxation and conscription. Hence, the best known of what, what are taken to be penalties imposed on conquered states, which is the deport, deportation of the population and its replacement by other residents from elsewhere in the empire. From the Assyrian point of view, this was no punishment. It was the Assyrian melting pot, a way of ensuring that over time, every ethnicity other than Assyrian and every allegiance other than to the empire would be forgotten. The disappearance of the 10 tribes of Israel into the general Assyrian population demonstrates how well the policy worked, even with people as fiercely dedicated to preserving their identity as the Hebrews. End quote. So the 10 tribes of Israel, after the, after the Assyrians conquer them, they, they remove them from Israel. And to the point where there's, there's not... Israel ceases to exist at that point. In the southern kingdom of Judah, uh, the Babylonians conquer them and, and take them to Babylon. But, but some of those Jews from Judah, they return to Judah. They return to Jerusalem. And that's not the case with Israel. And it's because of this, this idea of this deportation, but not only deportation. So the, the Israelites would be deport, deported to Assyria and to other places, but also the repopulation of that area in Israel by residents from other, from elsewhere in the empire. And this, this was modus operandi. This was how things were done when Assyria would, would conquer to the 
I, this, this is how the story took, you know, this is how it happened. And, and because of a serious policy. And so we, what we know of, of the history in the Bible about Israel, it, it it's because it's because of this policy. And it was just neat to see it from, from that side and, and to, to kind of know why the, the kingdom of Israel ceased to exist. They were assimilated in, they were moved. There were other people moved in that area. It was gone and it was not coming back. Very interesting. Those were fourth, four ideas that stuck out. In the next segment, I will cover the one thing, the one thing that stuck out the most in this book about Babylon. I'm sure you're all familiar with this quote that's found in Hamlet, and it's Hamlet speaking to Horatio. And he says, there are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy. There are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy. And I kept having that thought in my head when I was reading this book. You're, you're presented with so many ideas, so many ways of life, so many things that are, have been passed down to us that we would recognize. We are, we, but you're also confronted with what we don't know in the sense of we just have hundreds of thousands of tablets from this time that we haven't even read. They're just sitting in museums waiting to be read. And you just think of the potential there of, of lost knowledge that may be regained. And this is knowledge that was lost for two, three, maybe even longer, 4,000 years. And it's on these clay tablets. They were, they were, they were hidden. They were excavated in the last 100, 200 years and they're waiting to be read. I mean, this is how we got Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh was lost for thousands of years. This is how we got in Hedawana, again, lost for thousands of years. And, and we're, we're regaining these things. We're regaining these stories. What else is out there? What else can we find? But let me just read one part, I think, that, that really captured this well in, in just how amazing this time was, how amazing these civilizations were. So let me start here. And this is talking about a, the time period of around 2400 BC. So here we go. Elsewhere in the world, except in Egypt and perhaps the Indus Valley, at this period, people were still living either in semi-nomadic kinship-related bands of hunter-gatherers or the, the minority who had made the great leap forward to subsistence agriculture gathered in small settlements under hereditary village chiefs without writing and without metal technology. Yet, in southern Mesopotamia, long before Plato and Aristotle, long before Confucius and Lao Tzu, long before the Buddha and Mahavira, long before the Hebrew prophets, long before Moses and Zarathustra, even long before Abraham, texts were, are already employing the great motifs of morality and justice. The concern for fairness, the responsibility to protect the widow and the orphan from the rich and powerful. Here, too, is the very first use of a word that can be translated as freedom. He established freedom, Amargi, or the, or the citizens of Lagash, end quote. I, I love that. He goes through all these, all these people we know or, or works that we know, and this is before all that. And they're establishing great ideas of, uh, of morality and justice, concern for fair, fairness, responsibility to protect the widow and the orphan from the rich and powerful, and even expressing the idea of freedom. This is all long before we, we are ta perhaps taught that these ideas came about many thousand years before some of these these things and that just it blows my mind i just i i was not aware of this until this year uh i, I should have been but I, I i wasn't and so it's it's been a, a huge learning path for me and a really exciting one this year just to to know that these ideas have been around and um and, and as, as i sh shared in segment two just uh in hedawana um the, the flood and, and all that, it's, it's been really neat to think about. So that, that's my one thing for this book, just, just how many of these ideas have come from, from before, and we, we continue learning more and more about these.
So to recap, if if you're looking for a for a guidebook of sorts or an ancillary book to for like Gilgamesh or in Hedawana or even the Bible, this this is actually a good place to start. This gives a fantastic overview of many years of history, but really important part of history and the part of history take that takes place in Mesopotamia. You learn about a lot of different civilizations. So it's not just um, about the Babylonians. It's not just about the Assyrians. You're learning about the Persians. You're learning about other civilizations that interacted with this area during that time. And it's just, it's fascinating. I, I learned so much and so much of it applies to other things that I've read. There were so many parts that I, I, I wrote down in the notes, like, you know, you, you need to write this in the appropriate part of the Bible. Uh, things that were, that were written from the, the uh, Assyrian side or from the, from the other side and, and even giving numbers of how many people were, were taken out of Israel. Just very interesting um, ideas and, and, and concepts and things that I learned here. This book itself was also more than just a history. It presented some deep questions to consider and to ponder, not just about this area, but, but about history in general. And so th this went beyond the pale of just a, a regular history book, and, and I really appreciated that. Also, it's, it's quite short. It's relatively short, and you can get through it pretty quickly, but it's it's an important one and one that I think will help you read other books about this uh, that that are around this time period. That's going to do it for this episode. Thank you for listening. I'd love to hear from you, uh, especially if you are interested in Babylon or um, uh, the Mesopotamian air area. If you have other books that you suggest that that I should check out at some point, um, or even if you've read this book and and something else stuck out to you that, that I didn't cover in this episode. I'd love to hear from you on that. It's one of the reasons I started this project is just to connect to other readers and to connect to other readers who have, are reading the same books as me. So I, I truly, when I say that, I, I would love to hear from you. You can email me at eric at booksoftitans.com. That's eric with a K. So E-R-I-K at booksoftitansaltogether.com. You can follow Books of Titans on Instagram or Twitter, and that's just right at Books of Titans. And I have a website, booksoftitans.com. I've got all my reading list from 2017 through today. I, I uh, have my list of 200 books that I plan to read for the great books there. And for I have my 2023 reading list up there as well right now, where I have the great books interspersed with the guidebooks that I'm reading along with those. I'll be back in a week or two to discuss another book, hopefully the one about Persia. And until then, keep reading, keep learning and keep listening. I'm out.